Hello everyone, welcome to Robustly Beneficial. Uh, today we will discuss uh, recent advances in robust high dimensional statistics. Uh, this is a book chapter uh, written by Ilias Diakonikolaos and Daniel Kane, um, which is based in a, on a series of uh, recent papers. Um, they and some other quarters and some other people in other groups uh, published in the past three or so years. The objective uh, is to provide solutions for a robust estimation of uh, a robust statistic, a robust statistical estimation, despite the presence of outliers or maliciously, maliciously crafted data. Yep, and that's the paper we discussed uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so this is like we should say this is more or less uh, your your research area, like, uh, strongly connected to your research area. True, um, and it's important. Like, yeah, yeah, how important is it to? to robustly beneficial algorithms? Uh, for instance, if you do, for example, if you do statistical learning, machine learning, uh, you are trying to infer something from data. And you will do this job uh, in a safe way if the data is reliable in the sense that it translates some ground truth or something that is really observed. But if someone is hiding part of the data or corrupting part of the data, you might learn something else than what you were aiming to. So for instance, imagine you're trying to estimate the, the mean salary of Lausanne of, or of New York or any place. But uh, so you, you, you get data about salaries, but in, if, if a part, if a fraction of this data is corrupted or is not representative of the mean salary of New York, then you would have a wrong estimation of the mean salary of New York. So you, you would like to, for, for like a simple example would be, you want to learn what is the mean salary of New York. If you just collect salaries and take the average, and if you happen to have a few billionaires in the, in the data set, then you would think that the average salary if, of New York is 300 million. And a simple solution, a historically, the historically first solution was the, to take the median, if the majority of samples were fine. But then in high dimension, in the high dimensional uh, framing of this problem uh, is, is more uh, challenging. It's interesting to see uh, the, how much uh, the high dimensional uh, version of this problem uh, had to wait for the recent years to really take off. Yeah, like the, 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 the first papers that were, well actually the, the very first paper that was cited or one of the first papers were a paper by uh, Turkey. So there was this idea of Turkey's mean, mm -hmm. uh, median, median Turkey's median, uh, that is a robust estimator, uh, meaning that if you have a, f uh, like a small fraction or a fraction of, of poison data, then it still recovers the means of the inliers, the, the true data. Uh, but uh, Turkey's uh, approach, uh, Turkey's median, is uh, NP hard to compute. So it's uh, definitely not uh, tractable. Uh, it can be hard in the dimension of the space. Uh, so just maybe you can insist on the, the, the dimension thing because it's uh, something new. And uh, I think like uh, five years ago, you still had paper, even in machine learning sometimes, that uh, discuss uh, high dimension with D equals to 20 or, mm. or 100. Uh, now these days, like D is uh, the, the number of parameters is right. extremely huge. Right? So yeah, if you take the literature in statistics uh, and uh, maybe, I don't know, you search for the term, like for, for example, when, when statisticians used big data in a as a motivation for a paper up to say 2012, 13, or even, yeah, 13, uh, they would mean a lot of data points. Uh, so let's say there is N, N is the number of people you're collecting data on. Mm -hmm. But then for every person, you collect D features. So for example, for Louis, I connect salary, age, school, etc. That's like four features. But if I keep collecting features, uh, it can go to 20. If I look at, for example, uh, national statistics, you can have, you can have X, like imagine tables where you have one million of citizens and then a hundred column for every citizen. So D would be a hundred and N would be one million. Mm -hmm. And for up to the 2010s, uh, people would care about big N and very rarely care about big D, like very, 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 very large dimension. And today in machine learning, you'd have situations where uh, you aggregate models, for example, parameters of a neural network, where D could be in the same order or even much larger than N. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I maybe discuss this later, but uh, 
this the number of parameters and these days like uh, neural networks is usually at least a million mm -hmm. and sometimes it can go as far as uh, 10 to the 12 uh, for 10 to the 11 I think for, for some papers uh, so, so that, that that's that, you now you, you could say well, why is it a problem well the, the, the reason is why well, it is a problem and it's actually something that surprised me when I read it like I, I, di I didn't know this but uh, is that if you do so there are these generalization of the median so, so the median like for those who, who, who don't know what we're talking about like is like you the median of a set of numbers is like you rank the numbers in the right order and you pick the one in the middle that's the median and if you want to do uh, uh, for different uh, lists of numbers like this, so in high dimensions. Uh, well, one thing you can do is for each dimension to do this. Like, so this is called coordinate-wise median. So you do the median for each coordinate. Uh, well, this, like I was not that surprised that it was not that, well, in high dimensions it's not that great because you're making a small error for each dimension and these all add up. And in the end you get a total error which is epsilon times the square root of d. So the square root of d like, is very classical in, in, in statistics. Uh, uh, it's, it has to do with uh, like the, the variance, like the, the square root of the variance. But anyways, so you, you have this problem. And uh, the thing is that you have other generalization of the median, including like, the geometry me mm -hmm. geometric median, which for a long time I thought it was a great candidate for a robust uh, estimator. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that the, median as, uh, the geometric median as well is not uh, performing uh, well, it still has this epsilon square root of d. And uh, yeah, if, if you have d equals to 10 to the 12, then square root of d is uh, a million. So it's uh, yeah, like you're very, very far from, from the actual mean. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, maybe I haven't explained what epsilon also is. Yeah, I think we didn't <laughs> frame the, the, the problem uh, yeah, correctly yet. Yeah. So the, the problem we are, we are working with is uh, we, we collect data that, and we try to estimate the mean of these data points. And some, uh, some bad actor has poisoned the data, meaning that it possibly removed a proportion epsilon of the data and replaced it with uh, other data points. And uh, so the goal of poisoning is to make you learn a different median, a different, uh, different mean. And, uh, and this way, uh, it can, uh, it can man man manipulate what you learn for your model or, or what you what you think, and usually the the poisoning would would not be just ran computing random points because if you add up randomly around the around the, the mean in uh, in average, you would you would be actually to you you would you would be able to learn the right mean because it would all average to zero. But it the poisoner would try to attack in one direction, so pushing uh, all the the points that are that are fake, the fake the outlier data points. Push, pushing them in one direction. So that's why to the, the, the algorithms for robust statistics, they, they then try to learn from the data that is, that is collected, so both in layers and outliers. Is there one direction in which the, the data set I'm looking at is surprisingly uh, a surprising variance? Yeah. And, uh, and then we would take action to reduce the variance in yeah. that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was the, the, the idea of the algorithm is, uh, if I just rephrase it, like is the idea is that you, you try to see uh, among the data points if there's one direction along which it looks very suspicious. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do, you see, well, you, and there's actually a good reasons, like if, there's a, if you do the right assumption and all, you, you can identify this bad, uh, bad behavior in one dimension, and you know that something is wrong with high probability, and then you can just remove the extreme points, essentially. And then you have a, a like a, a better data uh, data set, and you just repeat this procedure. Like, but maybe it's better, maybe it's still not uh, good enough. You have maybe another direction where things go wrong, and so you have to repeat and repeat. Mm -hmm. And uh, this way of data cleaning, uh, well, they, they showed it's uh, efficient. Uh, um, but maybe for becoming to this, we can discuss more of the the the, the threat model, the the poisoning model, uh, because I, I think we had like. So, so in the paper, they, they, they discuss a strong version of uh, contamination yes. of poisoning, uh, meaning that the attacker gets to see the true data set, which is, well, arguable in practice, yeah. and then he gets to remove some of these points, <coughs> uh, but not all of them, like uh, somehow it's a bit weird, like he only can only remove a fraction, but anyone, like he, he can choose which fraction he gets to remove, and then he gets replaced by some other data. Um, the 
Yeah, it's true. In, in practice, this was a very surprising case. When uh, so, if someone has access to the whole data set and can replace up to fifty percent of the data, it's surprising to know why can't he can't he replace seventy five percent of the data? Yeah, and. Uh, but this, 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 these rules were, are necessary for the, for the problem of robust statistics because if, in the case of mean estimation, if more than 50% of the data can be poisoned, then there is nothing we can do about uh, estimating the mean because it, uh, if, if more than half, like it, it, the poisoner could build an, an, another, a, a totally different distribution and because we observe these two distributions that are se separated, we don't know which one it comes from the real mm -hmm. data set. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the different problems that are, that are described is the more, more practically in, a, in two days, for two days algorithms that are deployed, uh, there, are, there can be different types of uh, poisoning attacks. The, so, some, I think the most common would be that the poisoner can only add new data points. Mm -hmm. And if you think of a recommender system, for example, then someone trying to poison a recommender system would create some fake accounts to, to like some specific types of posts with the hope that these types of posts get recommended more. Mm -hmm. And we, it's, very, it's quite rare that uh, other types of attacks where someone can uh, remove inputs. Well, I, I think it's just semantics. Well, I, I, I'm sure the authors, <coughs> the, the authors don't necessarily like mean that the, uh, the attacker would go and remove a fraction. Mm -hmm. It's just a way to model that someone would participate with, with, with mislabeled data, mm -hmm. with, with wrong data. Yes. So mm -hmm. if someone participates with wrong data, the total data has a fraction that is corrupted. Mm -hmm. yeah. So regardless of how the wrong data was injected. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the yeah. second very interesting uh, point was about whether the attacker knows about the all input data that their algorithm is using, mm -hmm. or whether it doesn't know. So if, to come back to what we were saying before, that we try to estimate the mean of a Gaussian, if the attacker is giving me points that are very far from the rest of the distribution, then I would very easily identify them as outliers. Mm -hmm. But if he's giving points on the margin of my uh, the true mean that I'm supposed to to measure, mm -hmm. then I would have a more difficult time to to find out what are these points. So that's the that's where the high dimension part becomes tricky because uh, okay. she or he can give you uh, small fractions uh, close like close to the true mean, but then because of the square root d, because of the high dimensional aspects of the problem, yes, it would be uh, it will already be a, a hard enough attack. So, for example, we, we, we demonstrated that in the context of distributed machine learning, where we show that an attacker that puts data points that are very close to the, to the true mean, but with the deviation, and a small deviation that can add, add up on several coordinates, or the opposite, one deviation on one coordinate, can, can already do a lot of harm. Yeah. So depending on why you are trying to estimate, uh, small deviations could already be a very big problem. Yeah, exactly. So that that's the point that uh, we would detect large large deviations, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why poisoning needs to 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 be able to manipulate you correctly in a way that you will have difficulty uh, detecting. Needs to be small deviations, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's why it's interesting to to study the two cases where the attacker knows actually what's your input data, and the attacker doesn't know. If he doesn't know, then it's much harder. To know how to manipulate. Maybe to reframe my my yeah. my remark was that in high dimension, small is already big. <laughs> so a small deviation, so, uh, okay, yeah, a, a small deviation in high dimension is already something. But when important. you say small, you mean square root of d or not? Yeah, yeah, I mean because of the square well, root well, of d, you, you have a you have high margins of attack. Well, yeah, but, but I mean in the context of the paper, like they they, they consider the square root of d is big, hmm. right? So, but yeah, like usually. Uh, yeah, and I guess the well, so, so to me, that what's interesting as also, well, uh, also to have uh, this very strong model is not that you necessarily going to have uh, strong adversaries. It's just that you're preparing for 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 things that can go very bad, uh, like uh, uh, maybe like one of the databases was uh, more important than the other and was biased in a sense, and it it crashed or something. Mm -hmm. So you lost to this data. Uh, maybe you have some some uh, genes. On Excel that uh, mutated, uh, so there, there's this story about like 20% uh, of the papers uh, in biology have a flawed genetics. Uh, of genetics paper, they have a flawed uh, data because 
uh, Excel modified uh, the value automatically <laughs> of some <laughs> genes. And you want your algorithms to still perform uh, correctly, even though the, you know that there was some like, well, there, it was likely to be some distortions in your data that you did not in anticipate. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's interesting also in this regard. So I've been trying to think about like, um, for instance, what's going on really in recommender systems. You had this debate like, does it count as poisoning or not? Uh, uh, well, it's always hard to say. Um, uh, maybe a more general form of uh, of poisoning or, or data distortion. I'm going to call it dis data distortion. Mm -hmm. Is that you have this sort of uh, true data that you want to collect, but because of many possible reasons, maybe there was uh, bias, biases in the sampling, uh, because maybe it was a form on the internet and you only receive data from people who actually answer to forms. Uh, maybe there was a distortion because you had some, pe some people who reported this, maybe there was uh, some journalist who reported what they saw, and so there was this data distortion. Uh, and so more generally, I'd say is that the, the problem is that you have this true data you want to learn from, you want to apply your, your state-of-the-art machine learning on the true data, but what you actually observe is some distorted version of this data, and you don't know what the distortion is. And you want to have then some robust learning, but the robust learning, you, you have to apply it to the distorted data but because you don't have access to your true data. And in the end, you want your robust machine learning, learning from the distorted data, to be close to the machine learning algorithms that would have learned from the true data. I think this is like more general setting of the problem. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so if it, so I, I feel, I, from what I understand, your setting, it, uh, it contains the setting of a strong poisoning that they discuss in the paper where an attacker has access to changing epsilon proportion of the data. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so the idea is all in the distortion. Uh, yeah. And if you allow uh, full power on the distortion, of course you cannot do no okay. nothing. Uh, uh, but then what's done in the paper is you consider different uh, types of distortions. Type of distortions uh, 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 more precisely, different sets of possible distortions by, by the attacker. Okay. So like maybe a, sort, a set of distortion is like a, a function that removes data points and adds other data points. Yeah. Um, but you can have more sophisticated uh, like different kinds of, uh, and you want to, to, to your robust machine learning algorithm to be efficient for all of these, like for no matter what the distortion or within a data set of, of distortion is, uh, you, you want to be learning something close to what you would want to, okay, to be so learning. Okay, so one robust algorithm would depend on uh, what we know is the set of possible distortions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. From the attacker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think this is already pretty clear uh, with well, actually, at least the, the guarantees you can provide. Um, yeah. How much do you think is, is important uh, the work to, to build systems that are not subject to distortions compared to knowing the, that the system will receive distorted data and uh, working on still learning something correct but out, out of distorted data? Do you see this as two different problems that, that can be explored? Uh, well, if you frame this very generally, I guess they, all, like, they can be... <laughs> Uh, match up. I guess it's interesting then to, to look more, at more details. But um, so, so one thing that's interesting, maybe by taking this kind of a step back, is like you can, uh, uh, like in in practice, for instance, if you go on social media, you have a lot of 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 metadata about the data. Like for instance, uh, well, this video came out of obviously beneficial, so probably it was good and it was not poison. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, but you do have these other data. Uh, or, like other other things, uh, and you can assume safely or more or less safely. I think you can also have a probability distribution over the possible threat models, but you can assume that the attacker cannot modify uh, this kind of data coming from this account, for instance. Okay, yeah. So you can have a more detailed attack model um, by, by doing so. Maybe like I, I'm just trying to put this as a all right, I see. As an interesting research direction, which I, I'm not aware of being it explored so far. Uh, but yeah, uh, because so far, like, it's really just adding and removing, and you're assuming that the data are, we don't know their origin, for instance. Uh, and if you're doing journalism or, or research, like, you should not trust data just because it's here. And uh, the source of the data is a, a very important uh, metadata, like, and you want the machine learning algorithm to 
should be using this at some point. Yes, definitely. I, I, I guess uh, Twitter is fighting a lot of fake accounts that try to manipulate the, the Twitter feed and how much uh, some tweets can go viral or not. Yeah. And uh, definitely they have, a, they, I'm nearly sure, they use a lot of metadata about the, the accounts that they're looking at yeah. uh, to detect whether they are fake accounts. Like when, when were they created? But, but are, then, they all, are they all created yesterday and all liking uh, the same tweet? An example of this, like using, using some metadata or like using some, some of the, some, some, some aspects of the data to, to increase their, their credence or like their mm -hmm. liability. The, the trustability, how much you trust them. There is a counter example, like not ex not exactly on using metadata, but um, there was this conspiracy video that went on the front page of YouTube. Yes. And when YouTube apologized, they said it's because it, the video contained sequences from CNN. So the algorithm detected that the sequences come from CNN. So the algorithm upweighted the reliability of the video. So, oh, it contains frames from CNN. But, but, but which, then, 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 what, then it, that's exactly not what he means. Like what, what he means is like the video comes really from the real accounts of CNN. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then they're like, it's a, there's a blurry zone because... Uh, yeah, actually, so <laughs> but, but what you we say, can do is... Would you say it was wrong to update because it's all CNN images? Like, it doesn't feel that bad to have a few... I don't know, it, it, it makes sense, but it can be exploited. If I know that you use this metadata to increase the exactly, reliability can, of the... Can, data, the metadata. I can then, of course, I can inject metadata and like yeah. produce an anti-vax video and insert frames from Pasteur and CDC institutes and the research institutes in, inside it. So yeah. the, the algorithm will say, oh, this is a video about vaccines. It contains frames from Pasteur Institute and from the CDC in the US, Center yeah. for Disease Control. I feel like so likely it's reliable, and then I promote it. I feel like researchers are doing this uh, sometimes. Like they, they first look at the, the bibliography of the, oh, the yeah. paper and they say, oh, oh he's the authors, this and this. Or the authors. Uh, there, are, there are like many studies showing that like uh, if you have MIT or I don't know, Stanford or EPFA yeah. <laughs> in your affiliation, it's, you're more likely if, if uh, the review is not double well, blind. But that's harder to, 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 to hack like yeah, from an outsider. If you're not at MIT, like... Yeah, but, but for, for an, it's easier to do with algorithms because you can just insert like YouTube receives what, 50,000 hours of content every hour? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can't scale, like you can't check every video manually. So if people start injecting frames and your algorithm gives reliability labels based on where do the, the content come from, it might be hacked also in the same way. So I just inject CNN or I inject, I don't know, reliable uh, uh, Center for Disease Control uh, videos inside my anti-vax video. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we discussed also that there, there are some kind of data that is uh, much harder to manipulate if the data is encrypted, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. the, our, Google, our Google account, mm -hmm. no one can create this, the okay. same Google account as mine. And if you create a new Google account, you, won't be, you are not a, able to create an old Google oh. account. Oh, it's true, true. That's why I say it's not exactly what... what so, uh, so someone, like, someone posting frames from the Center of Disease and Control should not be upweighted. But a video coming from the account of the Center of Disease Control should be upweighted. Yeah. And I, so, I think so probably that's what YouTube or any other platform are already doing. In some yeah. Sense, no? but, but I'd say there needs to be research about how to do this uh, right. in a very robust right. manner, right. like yeah. with a well-defined threat yeah. model. Yeah. Right. It's, not it's, not, it's, not that it's not evident. You can't do, it doesn't, it's not easy to implement. It's not easy, uh, I'd say. And, uh, yeah, and with these things, I, like, I, feel, I feel like there's a high potential of uh, false good ideas or ideas mm. that sound good but are actually mm. counterproductive. So, yeah, theorems are more reliable. <laughs> well, then, yeah, theorems, you have to look at the assumptions. Yeah, as well, as well. Uh, so, yeah, maybe we can talk about the, the result of the paper. Um, uh, well, the results discussed in the paper. So, essentially, what they, they say is that uh, they did it. <laughs> like, they, they found an algorithm that, uh, like, for the mean estimator, so I guess it's very... Uh, it seems like a very uh, uh, specific problem in statistics, but actually the, the mean is very is very much everywhere, uh, especially when you're doing machine learning, like gradient descent, uh, even it's a mean. And they successfully provide a, a polynomial time algorithm to uh, compute a robust estimation of uh, the, the, the mean that's within epsilon, and that does not depend on, on D, that's uh, the big uh, innovation. 
uh, but they do have, uh, yeah, I, I like, I, I, I'm going to criticize a little bit. Uh, overall, the paper is really impressive. Like what they've done is, is really amazing. But uh, like, I, like all along the paper, I was like, I had this strong feeling that, well, okay, but you need to know the covariance matrix. Which is D-square. Well, uh, yeah, is, well, course. that's not that much of a problem because well, actually, well, the, the algorithm is, uh, is running in N and D, mm -hmm. and they need N larger than D, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, otherwise we don't, uh, we don't get any uh, improvement. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, ND is already uh, more than D squared. It's already more than we can take uh, <laughs> with current computers. Uh, uh, I'm just saying, in context where D is very large compared to N, what you, what you are fry, afraid of is Yeah, D but that's not the, the, the setting of the, the paper. Like, in the paper, N is, N is larger than, than D. Mm -hmm. Um, I was already going to the setting like where we care about large, large, d larger than n. Yeah, uh, we, we, yeah. yeah. Go back to that. We, we yeah, we'll just that. discuss the results first, right. and then we can yeah. move to this. Um, yeah, so so you need to know the covariance matrix, and it's actually a big flaw because in practice, if you're doing a gradient descent, like you don't know the covariance matrix, uh, and, and it's really critical to know the covariance matrix because uh, you, you then do this outlier removal in directions, and you need to know mm -hmm. uh, the covariance very precisely. Well. Like precisely enough to do this, um, but uh, they also cite another paper, which is a very recent paper uh, from last June, uh, which I was very very impressed by. Uh, it's a paper by uh, De Persien and Lequet. <laughs> Not sure of the names. Uh, yeah, I will put it in the description, and uh, it's a paper that achieves uh, this uh, this best possible guarantee uh, in a more detailed way even and. Uh, uh, so it's in the threat model where the, the attacker only can add uh, poisoning data, so it cannot remove uh, poisoning data. And they essentially achieve the best possible uh, bound uh, using a linear term algorithm, linear in uh, the total inputs of the, the prime, so n times d. Mm -hmm. So that, that was really, very really impressive. Uh, and, um, uh, I, I was almost uh, sad when I read the paper because uh, it, it, like, I felt like it closed the question. I was like, yeah, problem solved. Uh, no, nothing less to research. Uh, but it's a lot of great news that this uh, important problem has been solved. Uh, yeah, so you want to move on to the problem of D larger than N? Uh, so one of the main motivations today, to, like why, why people started researching robust statistics in high dimension in the past two years is because uh, I remember my first command on a million a million citizen and a uh, hundred columns. Yeah. So that's where like you were doing like classic statistics, I would say. Like you have statistics on people, you have data sets, and then you build a model of which the dimensionality is not much larger than the than the initial data you had on people. Uh, but now in machine learning we have models that are themselves very high dimensional. Like if you look at a neural network or a matrix factorization problem that's something used in recommender systems a lot like or just neural networks which most people know in machine learning uh, if you take a neural networks not today it has a lot of, uh, of parameters and when you do uh, when you do train it with gradient descent you are having stochastic estimations of, of the of the gradient and uh, it's a problem where you care about uh, mean estimation so if you want to use something, some building blocks, some black box that does mean estimation, um, you would care a lot about its complexity in D. Because if you do gradient estimation, typically you have much more dimensions than estimators of the gradient. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're doing great distributed machine learning on a hundred machines or a thousand machines. Your model is a million parameters or sometimes now even billion parameters. So D would be one, 1 billion and N would be a few hundred or a thousand in the best case. Uh, so here, here are situations where D exceeds N a lot. And this makes uh, any solution where you would require N to be larger than D impractical. In particular, like if D is 10 to the power 9 is 1 billion, you have to keep in mind that D square is 10 to the power 18. And that's, you don't want to run a computation in 10 to the power yes. 18. So, like it's like it would be 1 billion, like 33 years on a, on a gigahertz uh, okay. so, CPU. So what we discussed yesterday is that in that case, mm. simply by the statistical uh, complexity of the data, we can't 
have a good estimation of the of the average anyway, even without the data. Ah, uh, no, no. Here you, you, you can, like you have to go back to the solutions that are linear in D, but would have the square mm -hmm. root. D. So you would go you would go back to things like geometric medium, or me medians in general, like the medians family. Like there are like many ways of doing medians. They they run in linear time in the dimension, but they have an error that is square root of the dimension. Yeah, but I, I guess these these are asymptotic uh, behaviors. Mm. Uh, like a question you can ask is just like in practice, like like how do how does like geometric median or or, or stuff like that compare to uh, like for instance the, the the new paper that came out mm. uh, for n equals to one hundred and and d equals to ten to the nine? Is there a gain by doing something more sophisticated? Uh, I think the jury is still out because the paper is uh, is just new. Uh, but maybe there can be uh, improvement. Uh, probably we shouldn't expect uh, big improvements, though. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in your model, like you're assuming that uh, what can be pro compromised is a machine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you assume that the data of the machines can be compromised as well, uh, like the the n is more like the batch size. Mm -hmm. um, and well, I guess. What, what, do you know the batch sizes you usually use? I guess it's in the thousands, something like that? Uh, no, it depends. Sometimes you, in the 30s, in the 10s. Oh, okay. Like, okay so n is very small still. Yeah, yeah so, so it's not clear that there's a gain. Uh, like one thing that the, the, the new paper does is actually it's not a square root of d that they have. It's a, a square root of the trace of the covariance matrix, uh, which uh, is sort of like the effective dimension of the data. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe this can be much smaller than, uh, mm -hmm. than, than the actual dimension of the data. Uh, again, I guess the, the jury is still out. <laughs> um, but but uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting new research directions uh, mm -hmm. around this. Um, it's uh, a lot of uh, both like uh, implementation wise, I think the, these ideas need to be implemented at some point if you want to, to test them in practice and also if you want to use them in practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's also like uh, lots of uh, interesting uh, theoretical questions uh, about all of this. Um, yeah, um, I'd be particularly curious like uh, about uh, using different threat models where um, like you completely change the data, but uh, but not in a well, like the the f can be not just adding and removing, but it's like there's a more st sophisticated structure in the data, and maybe in this case like even if uh, most of the data are corrupted. Maybe you can still learn a lot if you have uh, the right hypothesis. <laughs> yeah, so this concludes uh, the, this, uh, this discussion about uh, robust statistics. Uh, yeah, I think the, the scale of it is going to be more and more important as we, well, it's already extremely important, like uh, these algorithms uh, that are deployed. And uh, as algorithms are getting, becoming more and more powerful, uh, more and more influential, then more and more actors will want to, to use them for their own purposes. So robust uh, machine learning is, is becoming very critical and uh, there's a growing uh, res community doing research in this, but uh, I think it needs to be bigger. So if you're interested in this, uh, we really recommend the papers. You can check also the, the wiki where we have a, a brief descript descriptions of the, the results. And I guess uh, I'll see you, uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Um, next time we'll be discussing uh, em emotion contagion in, exactly. in social media, uh, which is and, and a paper by Facebook, which was uh, very interesting and led to a lot of controversies. <laughs> Good.